biggest struggles and pain points first and foremost is what like over 3,000 counties in the mm -hmm. United States and people will like where the heck do I even start do I just throw a dart on the board what do you see from the successful negotiators not being scared I'm very strict on our properties in terms of like okay day we purchase is the day we market what are your goals what's your vision for you know getting into this well, one of the most common answers is like oh I want to make a lot of money quickly it's like okay mm -hmm. well that's great but we need to put more behind that. The thing about this morning on my drive here, it scares me shitless having to think about working for someone else. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Ron Apke, today joined with co-host Anthony Weiler. Anthony's been with us for, I don't know, you've been with us six, seven months in terms of this business. You've been doing land for years. Uh, so really excited to have you here, Anthony. I'm sure you guys have seen him in other episodes. But today we are talking about the four steps to getting your first land deal. And if you guys haven't watched, it was probably six, seven months ago, we had a more detailed one with the 13 steps. Yep. It, it's not, thir I mean, it is 13 steps, but we're going to get a little more broad with this one in terms of really dumb it down in terms of like, what do you need to do to get your first land deal? But let's first, before we even get into the steps, let's first talk about like the mindset when you're getting into this business. Like, why are you actually coming into land? I think it's so important. So many people come in and you told me this before we started this, like people come in and just, they don't have goals in mind. They don't know what they're doing, why they're doing this. They saw it on Facebook. They saw an app, whatever it is, like, what is the why? And t talk a little bit about that. Yeah. And I, I'm glad that we're talking about this because out of all the coaching calls that I've done, and it's probably been in the hundreds within the last couple of months, and it's been pretty common when we start those coaching calls and really understand like, okay, well, what are your goals? What's your vision for, you know, getting into this? And they're really, one of the most common answers is like, oh, I want to make a lot of money quickly. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. well, that's great, but we need to put more behind that yep. because, you know, in this business, there will be obstacles that come in, like that can come up and how do you handle those mental hurdles? And if you don't have a wire or foundation to really understanding your goals, then at that point, it's a lot easier to crumble. So I think it's a very important thing to really understand like what your vision is, like, why yep. are you getting into this? Why is this so important to you? So like more, less about goals, what we're talking about and more about like, what's driving you? Like when, yeah. when times get tough, if times get tough, not everyone goes through like horrible, horrible, tough times in this business. Everyone's it's relative for sure. But the ability for it to be bigger than just like about making money, cause it's easy to quit sometimes. Like you can get into something and this could be the right thing for you and you don't even know it. And then you quit before you even know that this is the right thing for you. So you just want people to have that mindset of like, okay, why am I trying to do this? Why do I want to make more money? What is it going to do for me, my family, um, everything external, my freedom, everything like that? Yeah. And a great example of that is actually a member, his name is Dylan. And I remember talking to him a while ago. He's done great things uh, with the community so far. And his biggest why is like, oh, I want to spend more time with my family. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well, let's really narrow that down. And his biggest thing was leaving his nine to five. It was very demanding. It's a multi-million dollar company out in Wisconsin. And he was able to leave that. Um, be and there were times to where he was nervous, like, is this going to really work? But he kept at it because his biggest why and his drive was his family. Mm -hmm. So understanding your why and your drive. And, you know, when you hit those obstacles, you can reach out to the community. You could reach out to us. And we're all here to help you reach those, uh, you know, reach those goals. Yeah. And I like... For me, for me personally, uh, I was thinking about this morning on my drive here. Uh, like, it scares me shitless having to think about working for someone else. Like, I mm -hmm. that is what drive. Not the only thing, like helping people do the, everything like that. No. But like at the bottom of it, at the start of it, it's like I, I want to be on my own time. Like that yeah. is the most important thing for me, and that is a huge driver. Uh, and some people just don't realize the freedom something like this can provide. And they they just always, like it's always just been that traditional nine to five. And there's different nine to fives. Like your corporate nine to five is different than working for us. Not like every, it, there's all differences with this. But if you're locked in and you feel locked in and all this, like the weekend's not enough. Like if, yeah. if you're not doing what you want to do, the weekend's not enough. And I know you were someone who was, before you came out here to Cincinnati, you're in California, you're commuting hours of day, like yeah. multiple hours a day you're commuting. Like that is a two, two hours, 300 days a year. That's 600 hours. That is adding up like over yeah. time. Yeah. Like my biggest why, like you had just mentioned, you know, I was driving on average probably three hours a day just to get to work <laughs> and home. And 
you know, my fiance uh, was pregnant at the time. It's like, I'm not anywhere near them. And now I'm literally right down the street from our office. <laughs> yeah, you, you, have a, you have a 15, you have an eight minute walk. Yeah, do, doing something I really love and enjoy and helping other people achieve the same thing. So really hone in, understand your why, what drives you that way. When you hit those moments, mm-hmm. you can revert back to that. Again, we're here to help and, you know, push you forward. But let's get to it. We said, we said it was the four steps getting your first deal. Let's get to the four steps getting your deal. Number one is selecting an area, selecting a market, selecting a county, selecting a zip code. Where do you want to target? And it doesn't have to be a full county. Like we're going to keep this broad. We're not going to say exactly how we do things and what we teach because there's different ways to do things for sure. Some people might select a zip code and be very, very precise in that zip code. But you need to choose an area where you're going to target landowners. That is the first step. Talk about that a little bit, Anthony. Like what are... We can, we can talk about how we teach for sure. Like what are we do in rural America, but where do you see people uh, holding up? Because you do a lot of selecting yep. market calls with people. Uh, what do you kind of see? think the keys are? Um, well, I'll start first with biggest struggles and pain points. First and foremost is what, like over 3,000 counties in the mm-hmm. United States and people will like, where the heck do I even start? Do I just throw a dart on the board? It's like, well... You can, that that works, don't get me wrong, like just make sure you have some parameters in place. But I think the best place to get started is just an area that you know or something that you feel comfortable with. And for me, it was a little bit tough starting out because I'm born and raised in Southern California. It's like some people say start yep. in your backyard. It's like, there's no way, there's no yeah. chance in hell I'm gonna target Southern California. Yeah. So I tell people, you know, try to target areas that you're familiar with or something like, oh, this state sounds interesting and just dive in from there and start to think about some strategies and frameworks you want to have in place. Like there's some people that that all have on a coaching call and they want to target areas that um, have a lower household income or areas that are more strapped to medical debt. Like they just really get um, into the nitty gritty of details or the data. And there's other people like, hey, I just want to know if comps look good. If it's a fast moving market, I want to jump into this. So you kind of get a mixed bag approach. But I think just having some sort of an idea and you know, being comfortable marketing that area, just as long as the data makes sense to jump into it. But my biggest thing is don't spend hours and hours working on selecting a county because mm-hmm. that's once you do that, then you get scared. And then by the end of the day, you're most likely not going to send mail because you're so you're overthinking it so much and you want to have an exact answer. And those exact answers aren't necessarily there. Yeah. And I used to be one against choosing a market in your backyard. And I've kind of changed my opinion, I think, a little bit. And the reason being why I didn't necessarily want people to start in their backyard is because I didn't want them to be pulled towards going towards to every piece of property that they have under contract mm-hmm. or every piece of land. And I didn't want them taking time. I wanted them to learn how to do this from 3,000 miles away. Um, talking to Justin a couple of weeks ago, it kind of changed my, because Justin does a lot in person with his sellers. He builds an extreme, extreme relationship with his sellers. Um, and that trust, uh, Justin's kind of changed my mind a little bit on it. I don't think fully necessarily, but it is a preference. I'm not completely against it by any means for yeah. sure anymore. Um, but yeah, it's selecting a market. This this shouldn't be some multiple day, multiple week project. If it takes two hours, fine. Run some numbers, believe in what you're doing. A lot of people will second guess after they choose a market. Yep. Move forward, make it happen. Um, going from there, like Within selecting a market, you're going to pull data on the land portal. Wherever you are pulling data from, you're going to have a list of data. Going from there, you're going to market to sellers. Like You need to market in some way. I don't care how it is. I don't care if it's email, text, mail, uh, cold calls, anything like that. Our main preference is direct mail, to be blunt with you guys. But that being said, we have people who come in and they're cold calling and they're getting deals cold calling and they're doing amazing things, cold calling themselves. Um, we have other people who come in with an extreme background in texting and uh, texting, cold texting, all that stuff, and they do really well. Uh, like I said, our main way of marketing to sellers is direct mail. But let's talk about that. Where, where are you kind of seeing? I, I think a lot of people just don't pull the trigger on the marketing part. Yeah, that that's the biggest thing is a lot of people don't pull the trigger on marketing. And I tell people too on coaching calls, understand your strengths too. Like Deshaun is a great example. His strength is cold calling yep. and he was just grinding out calls until he got a deal. And now he's like, well, I'm going to mix my cold calling with mailers. And he had a great podcast episode. I, I had actually just listened to it before, um, you know, us recording. Came out this, this morning. morning. Yeah. Yeah. And, but most of the people, 
are in the nine to five and the things that are most time efficient is sending out, you know, doing blind offers the way we teach it. But I always tell people is, you know, just get started, understand your strengths. Let's say if you have a um, advertising background, there's people in the community that are in marketing and they'll do pay per clicks. Mm. And we're getting tons of deal funding requests from one individual and that's his main bread and butter is doing is it really? clicks. Yeah. I don't know. That. And so it's, it's just really understanding what your strengths are and, you know, incorporate what we teach and then under, with your strengths and understanding that, you know, take your own approach to it. And I think those are people who see the most success, but just get started. If you're unfamiliar with all of this, we have a great strategy and framework into sending out blind offers, also a texting course. And there's people in the community, including us, that can help you with cold calling as mm -hmm. well. So it, it's just about getting started. So that's the biggest thing is getting that data and just sending it out. You've already selected the county. Now let's take that next step because at the end of the day, it's all about acquisitions. And if you're not trying to acquire anything, nothing's going to happen. The biggest thing, like we're trying to acquire land at 40 to 50% of market value. Um, if you're double closing, it can be more than that for sure. There's other strategies where you can pay more than that uh, without a doubt. But the key to this step, step number two, is letting sellers know, okay, I have cash. I'm ready to go. I can close on your land for X dollars within X days. That's what you need to let them do. You need to let as many potential sellers know what you are offering and about their land and how fast they can get their money. The more times you do that, the better you're going to be. And the key isn't necessarily the mode. The key is how many people, the mode or method that you're doing. The key is how many people are you actually letting know? Um, text is not, text is a bulk, bulk thing. A lot of people don't read text. A lot of people uh, view it as uh, spam uh, or scams, whatever you want to say. While direct mail seems legitimate, the way we send direct mail seems legitimate. So while we might not get a high, high volume of leads, uh, the leads we do get are extremely efficient. But you need to let sellers know what you're offering. That's the key. Like that's the whole yeah. thing with marketing. If I'm trying to get people to buy a product, whatever it is, I need to get in front of more people, get my product in front of more people. Our product is cash in their hands. We can get them fast close. We pay for closing costs, all that stuff. Going from there, step three, acquire. So you're going to be talking to sellers. You've already marketed to them. Now you are talking to sellers, you're negotiating with sellers, and you're going through title, all that stuff. Probably getting funding too at that point. Yes. But um, from this step, step three, there's a lot that goes into it, obviously. Let's just start with the negotiation aspect. Like, What do you see from the successful negotiators? not being scared, yeah. you know, just pick up the phone, have that call, understanding pain points and trying to figure out how you can help that person. And mm -hmm. you have to keep in mind too, like, oh, they're they're throwing out this high number. It's like, well, yeah, it's negotiating. Think of yourself, if you're receiving mm -hmm. a letter, you're gonna try to get top dollar. Yep. That's just the nature of the beast. So keep in mind like, hey, this is a game, you know, how, how can I make this work for the two of us? Um, and keep in mind, Keep in mind the options that you have is what did the margins look like if you need deal funding? You know, what are the margins look like if you could do a double close? You know, and if you're new to this, how can I, you know, have a conversation just to get reps and what can I make out of this? So just not being afraid, having that conversation and how you can learn from that moving forward. But don't be scared at all. Throw out your number. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. You're yep. going to get more leads. You're going to be sending more mail. Don't worry about it at the end of the day. But the people who are most successful is not being afraid to pick up the phone and have that call and have reasons to actually negotiate yep. to you. You're doing your due diligence. Something may stand out in that to where you're going to have to lower the price and be completely transparent. Most of the sellers understand there's a defect with their land, you know, and they'll understand that yep. with your reasoning and having to negotiate down. Yeah. Be blunt, be transparent. Like you got to get to the point, like too many people with negotiating, like beat around the bush. Mm. Like this is what I can offer. If it doesn't work, I understand this is why I can offer this. This is what we are offering too. Like, do not forget what we are offering in terms of the fast cash close, um, in terms of like what's wrong with their land, all this kind of stuff. Like I can get you $18,000 in two weeks. Maybe you have an option for them too. Like giving them option A and B is great. Like, okay, if you, you don't want to take that $18,000, I think I can get you that $24,000, but I'm going to need some more time. I'm going to need to line up an end buyer and that's what would turn into a double close. So having options in your tool belt, I prefer buying and reselling. Uh, there's less logistics that go into it and then going to title. So you're going to go through title company and you want the key to this step. I think Anthony more than anything is one it is one, just the willingness to negotiate being blunt, having that honest relationship. And then two is speed. Like you can't, if you tell a seller you're going to make something happen, you need to make it happen. Yep. Uh, you need to find a title company that can close in X days, whatever you told them, and you need to keep them updated throughout the process. The quicker 
from the first time you talk to a seller to when you get it to title to when you finish your due diligence, like all the speed of everything, as you slow down, as you go from a 14 day close to a 24 day close to a 30 day close, your chance of closing that property are lower and lower. Mm -hmm. The slower you are with decision making in this business, the slower you are in general, it gives the seller more time to back out, to do whatever. So I, I think speed is something that's often overlooked in this business. Yeah, and you said something really important that stood out to me because people that request deal funding from us, people that are um, specifically newer to that don't understand the process as much, it's quite surprising how much people will just send a PA to title and not speak to the seller anymore, or even say like, hey, this is the point of contact mm -hmm. to title, this is what the process looks yep. like, they'll take care of you. A lot of people, or I don't want to say a lot of people, but some people get the PA, they'll just send it to title. It's like, wait, what do you mean the seller backed out when you're one to two days before closing? Because mm -hmm. you, you never talked to them. You they never, didn't know what was happening. It, exactly. So update the seller. Speed is a huge one. And also tying that in with you have to communicate with the seller, be transparent, because you don't know if title is regularly updating them. Maybe they're not telling them anything until they get docs drawn. Yep. And then they're going to, you know, then you have your closing docs. So um, definitely speed and then just update it. Seller, when you send something to title, the seller should know it's sent to title. The seller should know an expected closing date. Like, listen, I just, Mr. Seller, I just sent this, I sent this property to title. It's uh, X law firm out of X city. Um, they're saying about two weeks for this title search. If anything, if there's any delay, if we can, we're trying to go as quick as possible. If there's any delay, I, I'll let you know. Do you want to close in person or remotely? And that's these are things like you get them to commit. Like you want them to keep committing to things. Like okay, yeah, I want to close in person. I want to make sure I sign. Okay, that's great. We'll get you a check in person. Uh, so just keeping them updated throughout the process. Yep. Uh, we we don't we have very few sellers back out in general. Um, if you're doing few. things the right way, it should be you should be ninety nine percent closing these sellers. And then number four, you acquired. So number number one, selecting the market. Number two. Uh, marketing to sellers. Number three, acquisitions, which is uh, getting them under contract, negotiating title, all that stuff. And then number four, you acquired the property. Now you got to sell the property. And again, speed is so, so important. You shouldn't acquire a property tomorrow and then list it next week. You should acquire a property tomorrow and have pictures ready, have marketing ready, know exactly where you're posting it, and it should be marketed tomorrow. Uh, you're just losing time on market. You're losing money by letting a property set in inventory, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. And there's there's no reason why you should not have it listed once you acquire it. You should have all that done on the front end. You should, you know, if you're planning on selling it yourself or think about, do I, am I using a realtor? If so, do I have all that set into place? Does the contract look good? Does all of this make sense? Do I understand the area? You, you just want to have all that lined up, especially if you are using deal funding. That's a very bad look. If you don't have a listing ready, then it like two weeks go by. It's like, hey, this isn't even mm -hmm. on the MLS. It's not on Facebook Marketplace. What's going on? It's like, oh, well, you know, I was just busy. It's like, you know, you're not going to want to hear that as a deal yeah. funder. Um, but yeah, it's just having all of your ducks lined in a row. You want to get that, you know, going, think of common questions people could ask. You understand the layout of the, layout of the land. Because, I mean, we're in this business to not only acquire land, but we want to sell it quickly, get our money back and rinse and repeat. That's mm -hmm. how this machine works. So, so yeah, yeah. Get, get all that set up. Without turning properties fast, like this business, you're, the business can, you can lose cash, not lose money by any means, but you can... Just put yourself in a much tougher position by not having marketing money, maybe. What, whatever it is, if you are just adding days on market for no reason without it being listed, like it is going to, it catches up to you. Like yeah. the slowness catches up to you. And I'm very strict on our properties in terms of like, okay, day we purchase is the day we market. Um, we need to start getting potential buyers, getting the word out. Again, just like when you're marketing to buy properties to sellers, like, same thing with this. You want to get in front of as many potential buyers as possible. If you're not listed anywhere, you have zero chance of selling the property. Um, I know this was like a high, high picture four steps, Anthony, and there's yeah. so much more that goes into this. We didn't even talk about due diligence at all. We didn't talk about deal funding at all. There's a lot more that goes into this, but I wanted to break it down into like the simpler steps. Like what are the high, high level steps, selecting a market, marketing to sellers, acquisitions, and then selling. Like I, I, there's not that much more. There's things yeah. under, there's bullet points under each of those, obviously. Is there anything we're missing? I wouldn't say anything that we're necessarily missing. I think this was really helpful and important to people because a big thing is you think of all of these things at once and it could seem so overwhelming. It's like, oh, I need to do X, Y, and Z. It's like, well, just understand the core basics, master that, 
and then the rest of the things will fall into place. Yep. You know, you have a community with us or whatever community that you're a part of, you know, to help you along the way and, you know, just take action from there. But like you said, there are steps in between, but it's just understanding the core basics, mastering that and moving forward. Perfect. Well, I really appreciate you hopping on here, Anthony. If you guys haven't already, if you guys are listening on Spotify, Apple, share this with a friend, leave us a review, share with a friend. It really helps. If you guys are watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button below. We release videos three days per week. Other than that, thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. As always, thank you for joining. Please do us a huge favor and like and subscribe our YouTube channel and share this with a friend. It really means the world to Ron and I, but more importantly, it could help change the life of someone else. Thanks for joining and we'll see you next episode.